the first few episodes, we saw that science rose to become a powerful force for discovery about nature, using Francis Bacon's scientific method, which he proposed in 1620. This method was designed specifically to find out the truth about the Creator's creation, and it was put into practice by people who wanted to learn more about the Creator by studying His creation. In 1840, a group of influential men in America set up a scientific establishment ostensibly to improve their status and image and separate themselves as professionals from those they considered amateurs. These men were Enlightenment atheists, and by powerful financial interest, they gradually took over the whole profession of science. They turned it into an atheistic domain where the concept of a creator has become ridiculed and effectively outlawed. In a few earlier episodes, we've looked at a rather remarkable physicist, an atheist, a celebrated member of the Freedom From Religion Forum, but surprisingly a thoughtful, wide-awake and honest one. Let's just peep at one of her recent videos. After you've watched this video, some of you call me a science denier. And maybe you're right, you know, maybe that's what I've become. But seriously, I've good reasons to mistrust science and scientists, and so do you. Most of what physicists do in the foundations of physics today is pseudoscience. It's paper production with no scientific merit that teaches us nothing about nature. It's mathematical fiction, multiverses, tales about the origin of the universe and invisible particles that no one ever finds. But that in and of itself is not the problem. Pseudoscience pretends to be science, but isn't. The new mistake in physics was that physicists came to believe that if you can write it in maths and it's falsifiable, then it's scientific. Unfortunately, it's the other way around. If it's scientific, then it's falsifiable. Now, if you make that mistake, then suddenly all kinds of nonsense ideas become scientific. And that, in a nutshell, is what happened in the foundations of physics. But the problem isn't that parts of physics drifted into pseudoscience per se, because this happens every once in a while in the natural evolution of the sciences. The problem is that it hasn't had any consequences. We've recognized the problem with ESP studies, chucked them out of universities and updated statistical methods to prevent that from happening again. But physicists have been inventing unobservable things that no one ever finds for half a century and are still happily doing it, believing it's proper science. And if it can happen in physics, it can happen in other disciplines. If you mistrust scientists, you're not alone. A recent study by members of the Strategic Council of the U.S. American National Academy of Sciences found that about 80% of those polled say scientists are competent and trustworthy, but the remaining 20 20% doubt scientists' motives. They doubt that scientists will stick with science when it goes against the scientists' self-interest, like access to grants or other financial support. I think they have good reason for this doubt. Indeed, the pursuit of self-interests, mostly financial stability, is what's driving the problem in physics. It's baked into the current organization of the research system. She points out that all kinds of nonsense ideas, dark photons, multiverses, axions, strings, wimps and so on, have flooded into physics, and that, of course, leads to vast numbers of worthless papers and PhDs. She noted that if it can happen in physics, it can happen in other disciplines of science too, and it certainly has. But very few scientists seem able to see it, and that's not really surprising. Thomas Kuhn wrote a book, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. It's considered one of the most important texts dealing with modern science. It's been read by millions all over the world. On page four, in the edition I read at least, he noted that a scientific community cannot practice its trade without some sort of received beliefs. 
On the next page, he notes that these beliefs form the foundation of the educational initiation that prepares and licenses the student for professional practice. He notes that the nature of the rigorous and rigid preparation helps ensure that the received beliefs exert a deep hold on the student's mind. Kuhn then tells us that there is a fundamental assumption that scientists take great pains to defend. Normal science is predicated on the assumption that the scientific community knows what the world is like. Now, a point worth noting here is that Bacon's scientific method makes no such assumption. His method seeks to find out the workings of the Creator's creation. There are consequences to abandoning Bacon's scientific method. Kuhn continues, Normal science often suppresses fundamental novelties because they are necessarily subversive to its basic commitments. And consequently, research is a strenuous and devoted attempt to force nature into the conceptual boxes supplied by professional education. We can see Kuhn's characterization in most of the people who've been through such professional scientific education. We can see why it's so unusual to find a well-indoctrinated scientist like Sabina Hossenfelder questioning the established paradigm. There are many very clever, highly intelligent people that I hold in high esteem who seem to see the weaknesses in the paradigms they were indoctrinated into, but they just can't break away from them. Elon Musk, for example, a physicist turned entrepreneur, and Jordan Peterson, a psychologist, had a discussion about the universe and consciousness. Both can see there is utter impossibility within the paradigm of their indoctrination. Peterson tries to get round it with psychology. For years he's been telling us that our behaviour depends on our evolutionary inheritance from lobsters and such things, ideas instilled in him in his professional indoctrination. Musk tries to get round it without abandoning the regulation cosmology of his indoctrination. But neither can see that the paradigm they've been rigidly schooled in must be wrong. Um, but the point is that the universe, at least according to physics, started out essentially as hydrogen. And given enough time, you had more um, you know, complex uh, or you had heavier elements and more complex molecules. And, and then 13.8 billion years later, at least on this planet, we have what we call consciousness in the form, you know. Yeah. But, but, but that means consciousness had to arise. It's implicit, at least. From hydrogen. Yeah. Well, um, see. <laughs> so if you just leave hydrogen out in the sun long enough, see, it this, starts talking well, to itself. Well, this is, I think, you're pointing to the same sort of thing that my friend Jonathan Pajot has been trying to elucidate, which is that there's, a, there's an implicit structure of possibility. He associates this with the concept of heaven. Like there's an implicit structure of possibility that material forms are trying to flesh out. And so in some sense, the possibility of consciousness is inherent in the hydrogen atoms, right? Obviously, because it well, emerged. Yeah. So... So it's, 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 auto, it's a tautology in yeah. some ways. But so maybe everything's conscious in some way. Maybe, well, it's just, see, maybe it's just degrees of consciousness or concentrations of consciousness. And there are plenty of others in the same boat, as we saw in episode 86. Can the sun be conscious? Does consciousness have to be confined to brains? The cerebrocentric view of consciousness we're very used to. But traditional peoples have always taken it for granted that consciousness is much more extensive. Plato called the stars and the planets the visible gods because he thought they had intelligence. They were the bodies of which they had intelligence as well. And um, 
I published a paper last year in the Journal of Consciousness Studies called Is the Sun Conscious? Um, in which I argue that the interface between the sun's activity and consciousness is its electromagnetic field. This may sound strange, but sitting right next to me in the form of John Joe McFadden is one of the principal exponents of the electromagnetic field of consciousness. Um, his theory is largely confined to brains. Uh, he may be appalled at this extension of it, uh, but uh, I think it's, you can make a perfectly coherent case that the sun has a conscious interface, uh, a consciousness interfacing with its body through the electromagnetic field within and beyond the sun throughout the solar system. And if the sun's conscious, what about other stars? And if they're conscious, what about entire galaxies which may have galactic minds vastly greater than those of stars which are like cells in the body of the galaxy? And then what about the whole universe, the cosmos? You may have noticed Sabina Hossenfelder looking very unhappy, staring into her lap. I wonder if this was one of the moments which brought her to realise she just could not go on any longer in the circus of pseudoscience. At the same time, you may have noticed Bjorn Eckerberg trying to suppress a grin as Rupert Sheldrake confirmed everything he'd been saying about science wandering off in the wrong direction. But perhaps the most interesting field where the paradigm seems to be falling apart is evolution. The neo-Darwinian theory of evolution, or the modern synthesis as it's often called, has been for decades not just a theory, but an established fact of science. The experimental facts are already clear. Neo-Darwinism is dead. Does the claim that Neo-Darwinism is quote-unquote dead overstate, accurately state, or understate your position? Well, it more or less accurately states it, I think. Um, the fact is that there are four major foundations of the neo-Darwinist position, that DNA is a self-replicator, it isn't. That the Weissman barrier protects the eggs and sperm from being affected by the body, well, it doesn't. Um, and that the central dogma, as it's called, which is that DNA is used to make proteins, but proteins are never used to make DNA, um, doesn't prevent... Um, organisms when they need to, to change their DNA. Now, those are the basic assumptions of the neo-Darwinist view of modern biology. And I'm afraid they've all crumbled. It's, it's as though you've got the foundations of a subject and they've gone. So, no, I don't apologize for using rather strong language. I think as a theory, it is now dead. By any criteria, if you show that the foundations are incorrect, then the theory is not worthwhile. It's worth looking into this a bit deeper. Let's do that next time. And let's not forget what we read in Isaiah 44. I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself that frustrateth the tokens of the liars, that turneth wise men backward, and maketh their knowledge foolish. Thank you for joining me for this episode. If you enjoyed it, please like, subscribe, and press the bell, so that you'll be notified as I release new movies. If you'd like to support this project, you're welcome to do so through Patreon. Find a link on my channel banner, and in the description below.